Welcome to MCTOC's curriculum. This topic is about anticoagulants. By the end of this 10 minutes, learners should be able to understand how anticoagulants are classified, develop an approach to anticoagulant overdose, and to discuss management of anticoagulant toxicity. Case 1. You have an 82-year-old female who presents with progressive confusion and easy bruising for several days. Her medications include aspirin, warfarin, furosemide, lisinopril, and atenolol. Her vital signs are listed below. The nurse informs you that her INR has come back at 4.9. What could be the differential diagnosis for this patient, and how are you going to investigate it? And what are you going to do to manage this patient's coagulopathy? In case two, we have a 26-year-old female newly diagnosed with an oral contraceptive pill associated PE and was started on heparin. Her nurse calls you because she thought that she had given five times the ordered dose by error about 40 minutes ago. The patient is currently asymptomatic. How are you going to approach this situation? In general, anticoagulant toxicity may result from an overdose, or more likely from a drug interaction or impaired clearance, especially in elderly patients with impaired renal function and polypharmacy. The main clinical picture of this toxicity is bleeding. Depending on the affected organ, the presentation can be one of stroke, GI bleeding, retroperitoneal bleeding, or compartment syndrome. There are several classifications for anticoagulants. We're going to focus on the one that's relevant to toxicology. Anticoagulants are divided into two main groups, oral and parenteral agents. Most of the complications we see are due to the oral form. Oral anticoagulants contain warfarin, warfarin-like, and the long-acting superwarfarins, all of which inhibit the vitamin K-dependent clotting factors, factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Therefore, vitamin K is considered a classic antidote for this category. In addition to warfarin, there are newly released oral anticoagulant drugs that target either thrombin, like dabigatran, or target activated factor 10, like rivaroxaban. Parenteral anticoagulants contain heparin, low molecular weight heparin, like anoxaparin, direct thrombin inhibitors, like bilvaridin, and factor 10A inhibitors, like fondaparinex. Let's go back to our patient in case one. She takes warfarin, has an INR 4.9, and is confused. In order to manage possible oral anticoagulant toxicity, it's important to know if there's any life-threatening bleeding. After that, we also need to know the current INR. If there's life-threatening bleeding, then immediate reversal of warfarin is indicated using prothrombin complex concentrate. If there is no life-threatening bleeding, then the INR is reversed only if it's higher than 10, using about 2.5 to 5 milligrams of oral vitamin K. In all cases, warfarin should be held for the duration of treatment. The activity of new oral anticoagulants are not precisely measured or monitored by the INR, and its reversal is not covered in this material due to time constraints. As we mentioned before, warfarin-associated life-threatening bleeding should be treated with octoplex, or prothrombin complex concentrate. If it's not available, then 10 mg of IV vitamin K, in addition to fresh frozen plasma, should be administered. In heparin toxicity, risk of bleeding is measured by the PTT. Protamine sulfate can be administered as an antidote, as it reverses the effects of heparin. Protamine sulfate has an immediate onset of action once given intravenously. Although it effectively reverses heparin, it only partially reverses the low molecular weight heparins. The dose depends on the heparin dose administered and the time lapse post administration. Usually, 1 mg is given for each 100 units of heparin received immediately, 0.5 mg for every 100 units of heparin within an hour and 0.25 milligrams for every 100 units of heparin after two hours. 
There is a risk of anaphylactoid reaction with rapid infusion of protamine, and if this happens, it should be treated with H1 and H2 blockers, and epinephrine is needed. This can be prevented in the future by slower infusion rates. Finally, our take-home questions are as follows. Question 1. What is the treatment for an INR of 3.8 in a patient with active upper GI bleeding? Question 2. In a patient with warfarin toxicity, an INR of 8.3 and intermittent epistaxis, what is the appropriate treatment? And question 3. If a patient received 5,000 units of heparin by error 5 minutes ago, what is the dose of the antidote?